And welcome into another episode of Top Stock, everyone. I am Riley Corcoran. Wilson and Fayetteville splitting a doubleheader last night. Wilson winning game number one, four to two, before falling nine to five in eight innings in game number two. Two teams went back and forth, some late inning heroics by both sides in game number one. Wilson had two runs in the fifth, two runs in the sixth. The bottom of the order is what produced for the Tobs. They went collectively seven for nine in game number one, and the bullpen locked down the win. In game number two, they had four runs in the fifth inning. It looked like they were going to sweep the Swamp Dogs, a huge momentum shift. Instead, they gave up three runs in the sixth, one more in the seventh, and four in the eighth to lose 9-5. to five. So the bullpen faltered there, but we'll have no time to sulk about it as they move on to face Columbia tonight. Columbia 24-14 and 14 overall. They currently lead the West in the second half standings and are a lock to make the playoffs. It'll be a tough opponent coming in to Wilson tonight. Last night, Columbia went up to Peninsula, lost a one-run game up there to the Peninsula Pilots. So for Wilson today on the mound, it will be a bullpen day. Six or seven guys, we might see them on the mound. We think Bobby Gazzola might get to start the right-hander from Reinhardt University, not quite sure on that yet. Wilson 22 and 18, and also in the second half, just seven and seven of making that push towards the playoffs, as well as 30 wins, a goal that this team has set since day number one. On this episode of Top Stock, we'll talk with Coach Austin Love about that doubleheader, games that went back and forth, so many plays that could have changed the course of the game. Nick Regner, a phenomenal story, will join me later on in this episode. Nick was faltering a little bit in the beginning of this season, batting near 120. All of a sudden, he's batting 240 right now. He had four hits in last night's game. Just great to see the development in the last two weeks. Matt, Mike, and I will break down last night's doubleheader and get you ready for this game against Columbia. That's all coming up. This is Tops Talk on Greenlight. Riley Corker and Austin Love back here with you. The Top Salvage is split against Fayetteville last night. Seems at first you would have taken a split, but considering how the games unfolded at least towards the end, it kind of disappointing. Let's talk about game one, the positive first. Another comeback win, get down two to nothing after the first two innings, finally grind out at bats, get it going in the fifth and the sixth inning. Bottom of the order, a recurring theme. Of course, we're going to talk about that here in the next oh, couple minutes or so. But for Wilson, game number one, what did you think taking away from it winning four to two? Just a solid one all the way around. Uh, you know, just all of it all together was, was very pleased. Uh, Michael Wells um, is continuing to develop, you know, um, his entire game and uh, he's working through some things and and really trying to figure out how to put guys away. Uh, he got a lot of hitters, two strikes pretty quick, and, and Fayetteville in typical fashion, they, they battled. And I think Mike had a lot of 3-2 counts just because of their you know, tenacity and relentlessness, just fouling off pitches and fouling off pitches. And uh, they got to us early you know, using that technique. And our guys, you know, like you said, we always hang in there, and we finally got something going late and, and, and scored enough runs to win the game. And the bullpen was solid, like we expect, in game number one at least, with Josh Johnson, Blake Myers, and Dylan Fry combining to shut out Fayetteville in the final couple innings to pick up the victory. Transition to game two, another pitcher's duel, JT Brubaker, probably the best we've seen him in a couple of weeks with what he was able to do. Before we speak about what happened in the later part of the innings, talk about JT, his performance. What did he do differently to make him more effective than he was the past two or three starts? I think he, he pitched, you know, Coach Serber had mentioned this, he pitched with a little bit more emotion and stayed focused a little better. Um, he took the adjustments that we asked him to make, you know, in between innings out there to the field and, and executed. And he really, he just, he stayed into the next pitch. You know, he didn't let the previous pitch really affect him. Uh, you know, so you kind of see some maturation taking place in, in him you know, as he's out there on the mound last night. And, and that's what we need from him because he's, he's got number one stuff. And, and when he has that kind of focus and, uh, and poise, he's very good. And it's tough to imagine at times that JT Brubaker just finished his freshman year. So he has a lot of time to grow still and get better with some good stuff he had on the mound. Let's transition to the fifth inning. It was one to one. Finally, the run started coming. This team scores in bunches. I can't explain it. Seems to score 23 runs against Martinsville, and then the next game may, may not score at all. But four runs in that inning, five consecutive singles hit by seven, eight, nine, one, and two in the order. Just getting it going. Nick Regner was a catalyst to that, like he was all night long. But that big inning. I mean, what was the difference there? Do you think a different approach against Ben Burns, who had been pretty good the first four? I think you know. Before that inning, I'd actually told uh, somebody on the bench, I said, I think this time around the order, we're going to do better things against this guy. And I think that's kind of what happened. Uh, you know, that young man, he tends to throw one lane, doesn't really come in a lot. And I think for some of those guys in that part of the order, like you said, Nick Rigner and uh, Bradley Morton, uh, you know, Zach Lee had a hit in there, uh, and Ridge, you know, doing what he always does for us. 
you know, they're able to get their hands out on some balls. And we drove some balls the other way. We drove some balls to the pool side. So, you know, it was very encouraging, especially since all those guys can run a little bit. We're able to do some things. But in that situation, you know, we just kind of let them, let them hit and play because several of those guys are hot right now. It's great to see the top scored four runs in that inning, something we're trying to get used to. But have you seen a team that has scored in bunches like this? I mean, we talked about the game in Martinsville. So many crooked numbers are put up. Or if it's not a crooked number, it seems it will be a zero in the half inning. But have you seen a team hit like this? Hitting is contagious, but not to this level. I've never seen it like this. I, I mean, I've been a part of teams where, and Seth Neely and I were talking about this the other day, I've been a part of teams where you score, you know, you might score four in the first, mm -hmm. and then you don't score anything, and then you score five in the ninth. Right. You know, so I, I have been a part of teams like that. And, uh, you know, that's why, you know, a two-run deficit is not, not so, you know, you're not so worried about it because, you know, you've got guys that can steal bases. you got, you know, Luke Lowry and Corey Dunbar. You can potentially put the ball over the, over the wall. You know, you just you got so many different skill sets that uh, that the opposition has to deal with that it makes them change pace, and in the end, sometimes they make a mistake, and we get we get more bases. So we talk about the positive: Wilson up five to one, and then in the top of the sixth inning, J.T. Brubaker lost his control a tad and uh, was pulled from the game. Before we talk about the bullpen and what happened, have you ever seen a game where there were eight hit batters? That's now the CPL high. Wilson, between the three pitchers that threw in the game in game number two, plunked eight batters for favor on a team that goes station to station so well. How devastating, how detrimental is that? Uh, you know, it's, it's it, it, the hit by pitches don't bother me except for in certain situations and what we're trying to do execution wise. I have been a part of a game where we hit 11 guys one oh, time wow. before <laughs> when I was at North Carolina A&T. We did hit 11 guys. I want to say it was against Campbell, but Campbell like to, they, you know, they like to stick that elbow mm -hmm. out there a little bit. Uh, but you know, uh, like I said, the, the hit by pitches aren't what bother me, it's the walks. Because when we're hitting guys, we're trying to execute some inside pitches, which you know we feel like is a weakness for Fayetteville at times mm -hmm. uh, with some of their some of their hitters in the core of their lineup. Uh, you know, and just depending on the situation, you know, you'd like to see our guys throw throw more balls on the white and make them make you know, make the ball be in play and, and see what we can do with our defense. So, you know, overall, you know, Again, it may have been a mistake on my part uh, with the long layoff after scoring all the runs, sending JT back out. But with, with the week we've got, uh, you know, we, we need to try to get guys out there and save some arms. And JT wanted the ball, and, and you know, we're up four runs, so we figured we'd roll with it. And the top still had a 5-4 to four lead going into the seventh inning. Dylan Fry was called on for the second consecutive game in that night. Been rare to pick up two saves in one night. How many people can say that? But... Uh, control went away from Dylan as well, and he p surrendered a run in the seventh inning before the big blow in the eighth inning where Fayetteville scored four runs. How devastating was it? I mean, the seventh and the eighth innings to have it turn so quickly where the Tobs were four outs away, per se, to have a sweep of Fayetteville. Uh, you know, it's baseball. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think our guys, you know, uh, you know, I call I call them guys, but I don't think our men, because that's how they treat these things. They're not going to worry about it. They're going to turn the page. We're going to play Columbia today, and and uh, hopefully pick up another win and, and continue to move toward the playoffs. And you know, our goal of having 30 wins for the season. And Wilson splits with Fayetteville now six and two with Fayetteville this year, but 22 and 18 overall, a bright spot. We're going to talk to him here very shortly. But Nick Regner, I know you've stuck with him all year long in the sense of trying to get him going. And last night was just a huge payoff. I mean, he's been hot the last week ever since Martinsville picking up two hits, but raising his batting average 51 points in just last night. Picked up four hits in the contest. I mean, to see him develop in the way he's gone about it speaks volumes for his character, number one, and what he's been able to do. But speak about being able to observe and watch him grow a little bit in the last couple weeks well you you say i've stuck with him and, and i'll be <laughs> honest he hasn't he's probably had fewer opportunities than everybody else um you know with the exception of uh maybe one other young man but he he's played his role uh when we needed him as a pinch runner and uh you know myself and coach calhoun we always and you know this we always yeah. talk about him we're like man he's gonna get hot eventually yeah. he's gonna get hot eventually he's got all the tools to play at the next level uh him and his brother their tools are through the roof um, you know, and it was just, like I said, we had a hunch. We've been watching his BP, starting to figure it out a little bit, get his timing down with his swing, and, 
and we, you know, rolled him out there. He always plays great defense, and we just had a feeling. And, and you and I talked, you know, you put a three for three out there, yep. and he got it. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you can get a chance to talk to him. Maybe so. I'll go to Vegas after a three for three <laughs> call on Nick Ragnar. But going with the same lineup back-to-back -back games, I know I didn't talk about it as we transition from game one to game two. So even a thought process through it or just after game one went so well, hey, we're, going, we're rolling the same nine guys out there. Got to keep the momentum going. It's time to win now. Yeah, the, the only changes we would have made – would have been with guys who are extremely hot. So mm -hmm. it just didn't make sense to, you know, and uh, to make your job easier as far as lineup card yes, thank for the you. 20 minute turnaround. You're still trying hey. to make up from Team USA, <laughs> by the way, still with all you know, those we double said, hey, switches. We'll, we'll roll it out there. <laughs> well, it worked out, it seemed offensively. The, the offense was there, didn't come up, uh, came up a little bit short in the second game, but still a good source of uh, offense throughout the two games, at least, for Wilson transitioning tonight. Columbia, very good. They lead the second half in the West Division, and they're a lock for the playoffs, but don't know too much about them. Again, like all these West Division teams, but same approach. I know you're, you, you'll you give me that line, but at the same time, just try and keep going and not look ahead at Edenton because there are some big games coming up this week. Yeah, you know, the game against Columbia counts just as much as the game right. against Edenton, so we need, to, we need to get our 23rd win tonight. And uh, like I said, tally them off as we try to get to 30, which is which is our next you know uh, benchmark. And uh, you know, just continue. To, we're probably gonna have to scrap out some hits tonight. As far as I know, the Blowfish have a pretty good staff. Uh, I got to see a couple of their arms at the All-Star game. Um, you know, I know they have a couple good hitters as well. And uh, and their their manager's he's a very very good guy and, and knows the game. So we're just gonna have to you know try to be good in all three phases and. Uh, put our best foot forward and hopefully win a game. The push for the playoffs continues. We'll talk with Nick Regner coming up next. This is Top's Talk on Greenlight. Bradley Corcoran back here with Nick Regner. Four hits last night, continuing his prominence, getting back up his batting average. And Nick, it's been a great last week for you. I mean, you came into the game against Martinsville late in the game during the, the big time win. You collect two hits in that game. The momentum just kept building. You have a five game hitting streak now. And after last night's four hit performance, you have to be pretty happy with the way the last week's gone. Definitely. I mean, anytime you can get in the game and start to produce, uh, it's definitely a good feeling, especially earlier in the season, uh, not really putting it together right away um, in the last week. Getting some hits is definitely a good feeling. And for Monday at Martinsville, I want to go back to that game because it's a different approach and it just speaks volumes again about how you've went so far in the last couple of weeks. You come in late. Anybody can just come in and go, well, I'll get one or two at-bats. We're up by 14 runs. But to put the hard work you put in in a game and have it pay off, those two hits, it may not have seemed like much. How much confidence did that give you to move forward? Definitely. I mean, anytime you can get into the game, especially in a pinch hit role, is not always the easiest for me anyway. Um, but coming into the game, getting some hits, uh, definitely gives some momentum going into the next game. And getting in the starting lineup a couple of times, collecting hits, and now on a five-game hitting streak with last night. Let's talk about last night specifically in game number one, that big hit that you had to start the inning to end up getting the game-winning run. Uh, what did you see at the plate? What was the approach going in there uh, facing a different pitcher? Uh, always try to relax a little bit, um, but lately I've just been trying to, you know, keep my hands inside, really letting the ball get deep, um, trying to see pitches and then go with them as I see them. So I don't know, really, really trying to make that relaxed state. And game number one, that was certainly the case to transition to game number two. When you get in a groove like that, I don't care at any level, when you collect three hits in a game, you're seeing the ball well. It's just the same approach going forward. Now is it to the point? I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves with how much your average has improved now, but to where you don't have to think too much about it. It's still, you have to focus every time you get in there, hey, I got to keep doing what I was doing well to, to collect these hits. Definitely. Well. For me, I try to take the same approach, especially when I'm going well, uh, have the same approach in the batter's box, looking at the pitcher and I don't know, just kind of roll from there and not try to get too far ahead of myself, definitely. And Nick Ragner now in the top 10 with Wilson Tobbs in batting average may not seem like much, but for where it was a couple weeks ago, a big time improvement. And I want to talk about the frustration a little bit just to show how far you've come because you've been a standout at Central Michigan your whole career really in high school all the way up the line. And to have a first couple of weeks or a first whole month the way you did, I mean, uncharacteristic, I think, is a bit of an understatement. I mean, for you, how frustrated were you at hitting how you did and just not, not getting the hits when you needed to? Right. That was probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever had to go through. I mean, for me, I've never really, I've never struggled that bad at anything in my life. So I had to kind of take a step back and reevaluate things and, I don't know, just kind of go with the flow at that point and try to rework my swing and eventually 
starting to get some hits lately. So. And to bring it full circle now, how nice is it for you to be able to maybe take a weight off your shoulders and more you get to relax and have fun now because the, the work you put in is paying off. Now you're trying to enjoy yourself for the last couple weeks of the summer that your numbers are finally getting back up to where you think they should be? Yeah, I mean, I always try to have fun no matter what. I mean, after the game's over, the game's over. But when you're, when you're doing well on the field, it's definitely a lot more fun. Uh, when you're off the field, so. And being a big time contributor at school ball as well at Central Michigan, that's why you're playing here in the Coastal Plains League, but what's that been like the last two years? You put up great numbers, you're hitting about 320, it seems like every year, a lot of speed. You have some pop in the bat as well. What's that been like the last two years playing at Central Michigan? Uh, I love it. Uh, it's, you know, the home away from home, mm -hmm. so to speak, but uh, I don't know, teammates are great. I love the whole atmosphere of it and wouldn't ask me anywhere else. In Michigan, a Michigan native as well. And the obligatory question, we had him on yesterday. It just so happened that you turned out a good game. It was back-to-back, -back, but your brother playing with him and uh, having that older brother role, what's it been like being teammates now at Central Michigan and playing for the Wilson Tobbs a little bit? It's because you're, you're the older brother by a year. Just to have a little bit of that role, how's it like, what's it like playing with a younger brother? Uh, you know, it's fun. <laughs> uh, I try to – we don't – we more we're more competitive. So mm -hmm. if I see him do well, I want to do well, and we're kind of we kind of go back and forth that way. So it's nice to have that person there to try to feed off of. And the Wilson, Wilson Tobbs now 22 and 18. Nick Regner, a big reason why the Tobbs are making that push towards the playoff. And you see so many stories throughout the course of a season. Now 40 games in, great to see stories like this. Big time improvement. Nick Regner will see if he can help the Tobbs make that push towards the playoffs. And we'll talk with Matt Micah coming up next. This is Tobbs Talk on Green Line. Riley Corcoran back here with Matt Mike, a doubleheader last night, feast or famine for Wilson. It looked like a sweep was coming. The right. Tobs were six outs away before they faltered and the bullpen blew it. One of the first times we've seen that. A couple things went back and forth. Let's talk about the positive first. Game number one, Michael Wells gives up two runs in the first two innings, but Wilson rallies. We've seen that so many times this year, Matt. He scored two runs in the fifth, two more runs in the sixth themselves to a 4-2 to victory. Game one, nice to get off on the right foot. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, you know, Mike Wells kind of struggled a little bit, but the offense picked him up, which was great to see. You know, we had big hitting from Lowry, we had big hitting from Dunbar, and it was great to see them get that victory in the first game. And those guys in the middle of the order, we're going to talk about the bottom of the order here in game number yep. two even more, but they got it started in the fifth inning. There were guys like Bradley Morton, Nick Ragner, who you just heard from, and a couple guys that were just great all the way through, very solid the bottom of the order being able to Bruce in game number one and then of course Ridge Gonson doing what he normally does. Exactly. Bradley Morton was huge last night. Same with Zach Lee. They, they were able to just grind out at bats, you know, put the bat put the bat on the ball and get on base for the you know top of the order and Gonson just did his thing. And then the bullpen again was solid like usual. In game number one, Dylan Fry yeah. came in, locked down the save. Looked very good. Let's transition to game number two. Wilson did beat Fayetteville four to two in that contest. Very good to get off on the right foot. Game number two, another pitcher's duel back and forth. Yep. JT Brubaker looked about as good as we've seen yep. in a very long time. He went three and a third without allowing a hit before Fayetteville started putting them together in bunches at least. But how about JT Brubaker before we talk about what ended up happening in the seventh and eighth right. inning of those contests? He was very good. What made him so effective? A little bit different than what we saw the first the last couple of outings at least. His tempo was good. You know, he, he got the ball and he wanted to just, just go. He get the ball, throw. Get the ball, throw. And also he used his body to his advantage. He's a big guy. He's very tall, very lanky, and he stretched towards the plate, was able to, you know, bump it up to like low 90s and use his curveball effectively. You speak about JT Brubaker and his size six foot three, very long and lengthy with his delivery as well. The top struggled putting the ball in the strike zone. They are third in the CPL with walks thrown at least by pitchers. And last night was just wild. Right. Game number two, they hit eight Fayetteville Swamp Dogs by far a CPL high on the year. JT Brubaker hit five. He's now second in the league on a personal level, but just from the team standpoint, how much does that kill momentum, number one? Number two, have you ever seen eight hit batters in an eight inning contest? I've, at first, <laughs> I've never seen that, you know, whatsoever. I've never seen, you know, that many hit by bat, uh, hit batters. And also, that kills the momentum so much because you're, if you're a fielder and you're just out there and you he see, you know, another hit batter, another hit batter, it just kills momentum and just makes the game so much slower. And for a pitcher, you know, you want your fielders to be involved in the game. It makes the game quicker, makes the game more enjoyable, and also gets that, you know, good vibe for them when they get in the dugout for uh, their at-bats. And for Fayetteville, putting runners on base something you do not want to do. Fayetteville has interesting stats to say the least. They lead the CPL in batting average 257. 
right in about 10th place in doubles, but as far as triples, they hit just their second as a team all year long. They have not hit a home run yet in their first 35 games. So they're a single station to station type team. When you give them free bases, you find out what happens like last night in game number two for Wilson. The bullpen really was not on top. It just was amazing to me that Blake Myers and Dylan Fry went again in game yeah. number two. Dylan Fry having to throw in two consecutive games. They wanted him to pick out a four-out save as Wilson had a big inning. Bottom of the fifth, let's get to the positive first, at least from right. the offensive side of things. It was one-to-one. -one. Wilson put up a four spot. You thought the game was virtually over in right. a seven-inning contest. Five consecutive singles by seven, eight, nine, one, and two. Nick Regner, again, who you just heard from, was in the mix on that right. rally, as well as Ridge Gonsolin, Sean Godfrey, like Bradley Morton had a huge night for Wilson. But to put five consecutive singles together, pretty nice to see for Wilson. This team just hits in bunches. It's hard to explain. Right. You know, just like you said, you know, hits in bunches is the perfect word for a perfect term for right. it. You know, Nick Regner came up huge. He was struggling early in the year, and yesterday he was taking pitches outside the outside part of the plate. He was just going the other way with it. He, you know, didn't try to to, to do too much with it. Didn't try to pull the ball. It just went to the opposite field. It was great to see. And Nick Regner raising his batting average over 50 points last night. Pretty amazing yeah. to see. And for the Tobs as a team, they get up 5-1. to one. Then all of a sudden, Brubaker loses control. He gets pulled from the game. Blake Myers, maybe one batter too long. Yeah. Dylan Fry called on to pick up his second save of the night, trying to get four outs this time. Didn't go as planned for Dylan Fry. And then the eighth inning, couple risky plays back and forth and hit batters, walks, and Fayetteville takes advantage in extra innings to salvage the split. But you look at big picture. For Wilson, they had a chance to get back within a half game, it seemed, to Fayetteville for second place. Instead, they still pick up a little bit of ground on Wilmington after last night. If you would have told me in the middle of June with how the Swamp Dogs had dominated the Tobs, pretty happy, I guess, with the split coming away from this. Right. You know, that's just a confidence booster for them. They know they can compete with them. Right. They know they, you know, they can grind with them and be at that level to go, go into the playoffs and do some damage in the playoffs. And that's very important because these teams will score off four more times, believe it or not, before the end of the year. Two games on Saturday before closing out the regular season. Two games on August 5th. One quick note on tonight's game playing Columbia. The Blowfish are very good. Yep. First half, second half leaders rather in the West Division. Also overall record just behind Ashboro, so they're a lock for the playoffs, but very solid pitching-wise than hitting. They can hit for power. They're just a very good team all the way around the board, and for the Tobs, a different approach of facing a team that I don't know too much about other than the record that they're very good. Last non-conference game, you can say, at home. How does Wilson really approach this and try and move forward with Bobby Gazzola getting the start? Yeah, they, the, you know, the Blowfish, they remind me of Edenton. They mm -hmm. do everything right. You know, they just, they're one of the best teams in the whole entire league that they dominate the West. So for the Tobs just to, you know, get more confidence and play well against them, hopefully getting, getting the win tonight, that will give them the confidence going against Edenton later on this week. And Edenton, three games in a span of two days, and the Tobs hit a big road trip Four games, make it five games in five days if you count that Edenton contest. And if you want to keep up with the Wilson Tobs, you're going to be updating yep. social media, of course, like always, Facebook, Twitter. Just remind our fans one more time on how to keep in touch with the Wilson Tobs as they enter this long road right. stretch. Yeah, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Wilson Tobs as we make that run towards the Petit Cup, towards the playoffs. I'll be tweeting from the games, all the in-game tweets, all the pictures, all the videos. So definitely keep up with us on social media. And the Wilson Tobs right now currently one game ahead of the Wilmington Sharks. Can they keep pace tonight if they can beat Columbia? We'll see as uh, Bobby Gazzola will get the yep. start for Wilson. We'll wrap up the show next. It's the Tobs Talk on Greenlight. And another episode of Top Stock in the Books. Wilson salvaging a split against the Fayetteville Swamp Dogs last night, winning 4-2 before falling 9-5 in extra innings. A wild affair, a late night at the ballpark. The Tobs have no time to think about it. They will turn around and play the Columbia Blowfish tonight, who are very impressive. A 24-14 record. They currently lead the West Division in the second half standings, are a lock to make the playoffs. They're very good on the mound as well as at the plate. So it'll be a tough matchup for Wilson, who will use a bullpen staff today. And we might see five, six, seven pitchers for Wilson throughout the course of this ball game, trying to save pitching for the important week ahead as they take on Edenton on Wednesday before that very important Thirsty Thursday doubleheader on Thursday against the Steamers. And then it does not let up. Wilson goes on a five-game road trip in five days, currently one game ahead of the Wilmington Sharks, making that push for the playoffs right now. Every game is crucial despite who they play, but Wilson will face playoff contenders their next seven games. So no letting up in the schedule. We'll see if Wilson 
Wilson can get it done. We'll be on Top Stock again on Thursday to get you set for that Thirsty Thursday doubleheader against the Eatonton Steamers. This is Top Stock on Greenlight.